Member countries of BRICS, a growing non-Western economic collective, are meeting for their 15th annual summit in South Africa this week with a big announcement. Five new member countries have been added to the current bloc. Egypt, Ethiopia, Argentina, the UAE, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. They join current members Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Now, at the summit, leaders from member countries discussed de-dollarization, Western global hegemony, and moving toward a multipolar world. In a thinly veiled statement, Chinese President Xi Jinping wrote, quote, one country obsessed with maintaining its hege hegemony has gone out of its way to cripple the emerging markets in developing countries. Whoever is developing fast becomes its target of containment. Whoever is catching up becomes its target of obstruction. But this is futile. As I have said more than once, that blowing out others' lamp will not bring light to oneself. Joining us now to weigh in as editor at The Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Now, this feels like a really significant global shift um, and an end, as people are saying, to Western hegemony that many people predicted as we headed into this Ukraine proxy war, China becoming more closely aligned with Russia, and this, this, this growth of this economic alliance that's meant to counterbalance Western hegemony and, and economic dominance seems to be really telling. Help us understand what, what's at stake here. Well, this is the most historic gathering of the BRICS, which was founded in 2009 to democratize international trade and international institutions by fostering multipolarity, countering the bipolar, unipolar world that's emerged since the collapse of the Soviet Union, which has brought on disaster for the global south, as well as unchecked violations of international law through coalitions of the willing. Uh, as we've seen in Iraq and beyond. Uh, the BRICS aims to foster trade through a new development bank, as it's called, and this could potentially upend the hegemony, the domination of the dollar, particularly if states like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, who, which provide the basis for the petrodollar, which is itself the foundation of dollar hegemony, if they join, and begin trading in local currency. For example, Saudi Arabia is discussing uh, trading or uh, selling oil to China in renminbi, which would break the dominance of the petrodollar. So the reason this uh, gathering is so historic is because BRICS is actually talking about expanding and has pledged to expand to some very significant countries, including Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, but of course, expansion can bring a lot of political complication. The U.S. has been trying to, um, you know, flex its influence uh, all over the world for so long. You know, we spent so much money. We're spending so much money right now in Ukraine, the projects in the Middle East, the bases everywhere, on and on and on. Do you think the American people might feel at some point cheated by their government that so much money of this money has been spent? Um, to, uh, to, and you might say that was not a good idea to do this in the first place, but we did do it, and yet we did not, we were, our influence is in decline, despite how much effort and how many resources we've exhausted to remain, you know, the top, the top country, the top government in the world. Well, our correspondent, Anya Parampil, is in Johannesburg covering the BRICS right now, and one thing she's noticed at a conference which mostly pertains to the nations of the global south uh, especially the non-aligned nations that didn't line up with the Soviet Union or the U.S. during the Cold War and which seek to fight for their independence, is the presence of many Americans as well as British reporters from places like The Economist. What are they doing there? Well, they sort of represent the interests of the G7, which is often posited as the, you know, the dominant sphere of uh, economic sphere, and they're threatened by what's happening at BRICS because of the prospect of de-dollarization, which is the, and the dollar, dollar hegemony is the basis for US financial sanctions, which are administered unilaterally, not through the UN, to destroy the economies and the people of countries from Syria to Venezuela, to Cuba, uh, to countries like Eritrea, which is kind of the Cuba of Africa and has resisted IMF loans, taken its own line. And what the US has done, by actually sanctioning one third of the world's population, think about that, is created a backlash where these countries are now gathering together and figuring out how they can conduct trade and break away 
from the dollar. And you've heard that expressed in the president's roundtable today that was held and convened by UN General Secretary Antonio Guterres from Venezuela, for example, or from Eritrea about the unfairness of global relations with the dollar dominating all trade and their desire to break it. They're not, they're, they're not uh, hiding their agenda right now. However, there are other nations like Brazil, which have feared expansion of the BRICS uh, because they don't want to come to loggerheads with the US. And Brazil has only agreed to allow Argentina in at this point. But the desire is there, the possibilities are there, and the U.S. is making it almost impossible for many of these countries to operate within the Bretton Woods system and not be financially immiserated. So I think what's really important, if you want folks to really understand what's going on here, is to get at the root of what Xi Jinping was saying in the quote that we read at, at the top. This idea that this isn't conspiracy, this isn't just, you know, our quote-unquote enemy talking, but that it has been an explicit in harshly inflicted policy of the United States of America to maintain global dominance by actively suppressing other countries as they grow and develop, either through sanctions, right. as you pointed out, with one third of the world's uh, 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 people being sanctioned, um, or through other kind of uh, economic tools like the IMF. But I do think sometimes we skip over how exactly something like the IMF, which many people understand is just you know a good thing that gives money to governments so that they can grow, right. and are we just being charitable? I mean, how do all of those global organizations, those uh, financial organizations, act as a tool of the government in this way? And therefore, you know, and, and how does that help us understand why this BRICS alliance and the growth of the BRICS alliance is so important to, sh to shaking off the shackles of U.S. control, economic control? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I mean, that's the point of the New Development Bank is to give out loans that are favorable to countries who do not want to have to meet the political conditions that the United States and its uh, transatlantic partners meet out and impose on them. So we can look at what's happening in Argentina right now. After years and years of austerity imposed by the IMF because uh, the, their reserves are dried up and they're experiencing hyperinflation, the, the country's shifting right. And the front runner in their election is Javier Malay, who's a right wing libertarian, which may actually complicate their BRICS membership as well as Latin American cooperation. Or we can put the, think of this in light of the Hunter Biden scandal uh, and what the IMF, how the U.S. uses the IMF even against supposed allies. Joe Biden, when his son was on the Burisma board, went to Kiev and threatened them with an IMF loan, showing how the U.S. can control the IMF and said, you will not receive this loan unless you, quote, reform your judiciary, fire the prosecutor, and do everything that might have been needed to protect Burisma from prosecution. Uh, so it actually fostered more corruption in Ukraine. And then once they got the loan, they had to meet all these uh, austerity conditions, which have doomed the Ukrainian population, of particularly Ukrainian workers, sold off their land, and so BRICS is presenting an alternative, and it's also politically significant that Russia and China are able to break through the attempts to isolate them, or in Joe Biden's words, reduce the ruble to rubble. Vladimir Putin, in his address to BRICS, pledged to actually supplant Ukraine as a global grain supplier to Africa and promised tons and tons of free grain to Africa. Africa has experienced the brunt of the Ukraine proxy war and U.S. sanctions and complications of grain exports. And so this is massive for Africa. And then we can look at what's happening inside Africa in the Sahel region, where you have these popular coups overthrowing governments that had been tools of the West, particularly Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, particularly tools of France. And Niger is following on the foothills of this multipolar development by starting a, a new company to not just export tomatoes and then import tomato paste, but to actually produce tomato-based products and to industrialize their gold production, which right now consists of a lot of youth in informal artisanal mines holding out pans in water. Uh, this is, so this is a, a massive development that will have a ricochet effect throughout the African continent.
Mm. Yeah, that's, that's such an important point. I just did a deep dive on Niger on my own podcast recently. I was really shocked by an expert who was explaining the extent to which all of those countries in the so-called post-colonial era, era were very much still subject to uh, control of Fran uh, by France through their currency and have been victims of a highly ex extractive relationship with France throughout and, and, and have, have intentionally their infrastructure and their development thwarted while China's approach has been to build stadiums and infrastructure. And, and that's part of why it's been so dominant. One last question that I had for you, though, is the American public since the end of the Cold War has been convinced that America's efforts to maintain global dominance are in the interest of the American people. There was the domino theory and the broad public investment and the idea that you had to beat the Soviets, got to beat them to the moon, you got to beat them around the world. It justified any number of wars, Vietnam, et cetera, stopping the expansion of communism. Is something changing now, or are we still in a situation where the idea of um, other global powers emerging, namely China, is being used by people to beat the drum of war? And if that's the case, you know, what, how should Americans think about the decline of American dominance globally? Are they wrong to think that it will negatively impact their standards of living? And why should they think differently about perhaps a kind of global solidarity? Well, we're looking at the decline of American hegemony, but this doesn't necessarily mean that the U.S. is experiencing an economic decline. Our economy is completely financialized and based on artificially backed currency. Uh, but the U.S. has the means to do what other countries are doing to fuel its own development if it actually sought to do it, if it wasn't selling off its industrial base at the whims of corporations. But that's just not the, the reality that we've been living in. And I just think most, many Americans, and actually most Americans now uh, oppose aid to Ukraine. They don't accept this argument that sending aid there is actually beneficial to Americans in any way because they experienced what Biden falsely called the Putin price hike, which was actually the NATO price hike by electing to sanction Russia. The U.S. was no longer able to offset the oil that it refused to import from Iran and Venezuela and other oil producers because of political sanctions on those countries. So Americans need to understand how their government sanctions have a boomerang effect at home. They are not going to experience it as strongly as Europeans or Africans for that matter, but they're beginning to get the picture and we see it even playing out in the Republican debates. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, who's just basically a proxy for Trump on so many positions, he successfully exposed the gulf between the Republican corporate elite and the Republican base on Ukraine, which understands that this war, it doesn't benefit it, and used it to break through in the debate while the rest of the candidates took the George W. Bush position, which has been discredited. Uh, there's no candidate putting forward that line within the Democratic Party, uh, but it will be exposed further throughout this campaign yeah. that Americans understand they don't benefit from this so-called rules-based order in which the U.S. seeks to make the rules and everybody else has to follow its orders. Americans would like to have friendly trade relations, too, to benefit their economic future. Yeah. My uh, Ramaswamy's uh, break with the rest of the candidates on the Ukraine issue is something I talked about on my radar, which viewers should check out if they missed it. Thank you, Max, so much for joining us. Thanks, and check out the Gray Zone for coverage from BRICS by Anya Parampil. Absolutely.